This is Six Tackles with Gus with Matthew Thompson and Gus Gould. Welcome to Six Tackles for another week. Very exciting episode coming up today. New South Wales and Queensland, both of their teams announced for Game 2. Is Luke Brooks leaving the Tigers? We don't know. Shane Flanagan, the new Dragons coach. Some great Ask Gus questions and we'll have a look at Round 16, which I think is really interesting given the absence of Origin players. You well, Gus? I am, Matt. How are you? Excellent. I'm just waving to the people home there. I didn't. They said I don't acknowledge the camera enough. Oh yeah. Doing it because I thought it was a podcast. I didn't know it was going to be online. I'm the same. Yeah. They said you look disinterested, and I said I'm not disinterested. I just didn't know the camera was on. Hello, everyone. Yeah. We need to remember the camera's on, don't we? Yep. All right. Um, lots to talk about today. Let's start with yes or no. Yes! No. If you're a sports fan, Gus, not much sleep over the next couple of months. It's all happening around Great the world. Great time of year. Great it time is. of year. In the United States, it's the US Open this week. My question is, Jason Day is Australia's best hope of winning the tournament. No, 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 no. no. We've got plenty of chances. How many Australians in the field? I don't know. I was hoping you'd know. Right. I was hoping you'd know. Well, plenty well they're all there, aren't they? Cameron Cause... Smith will be in the field. Adam Scott will be in the field. Mm. There'll be a few of them over there. I like Jason Day this week. Do you? It's been going good. Mm. Um, if you just pad for a minute, I'm going to find out how many Australians are in the uh, in the field. Hello, everyone. Um, top Aussie. Top Aussie. Top Aussie. Top Australian player. Okay, one, two, three, four, seven. Cameron Smith, Jason Day, two favourites. Adam Scott, Lucas Herbert, Minwoo Lee, Cameron Davis, and Carl Phillips, who I've never heard of previously. So it's a it's a reasonable contingent. Yep. I actually saw some some vision of that course. Um, someone threw a threw a ball down the middle of the fairway, and it, the ball just went off one of the slopes and went all the way into the rough. Hmm. Tough. Well, Tough. It's supposed to be. It's a US Open. Steve Smith is Australia's best batsman since Bradman. Well, statistically, he is. Mm. Certainly is. He's a, he had a golden patch there for a while, then a little bit of a form slump, which they all do, but he seems to score 100 whenever the mood strikes him. He's um, a big game player. He certainly is. The Ashes, exclusively live to 9-9 nine and nine now from Friday. Now, Steve Smith, with that century in the World Test Championship, has now gone to 31 Test 100s. He has the third most centuries of any Australian batsman. He's played 97 tests. He's one behind Steve Waugh, who made 3,200s, but played 71 test matches more than Steve Smith, Gus. Mm. That's a remarkable record. To think that he made the team as a potential leg spinner. I know. He batted I, number eight on debut. I can remember he was going to be the, the next one after Shane Warne, they thought, was going to be our next great leg spinner. Um, doesn't bowl a lot these days, doesn't have to, but he made the team as a batsman, and then he made the team his own. Mm. He's been quite remarkable. Incredible. He's got Steve Waugh and Don Brad... Uh, sorry, Steve Waugh and Ricky Ponting ahead of him. Only as uh, batsmen to have scored more test centuries for Australia. The Ashes getting underway Friday. Cannot wait to see all that. Has the bubble burst for the Dolphins? No, 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 no. What's this bubble burst? Though? Bubbles don't burst, mate. Bubbles don't burst. That's not the end of it. Does the bubbles burst for the storm because they got beat by 45? Did the bubble burst for the sharks because they got beat by 50? I don't think so. Sharks? Sharks' bubble might have burst. I don't think so. I don't think so. Bubble, you have your bad days. Everyone has one of those. But I don't think the bubble has burst for the dolphins. They're just the, they're the beginning. Everything they're doing at the moment is just wondrous. It's, uh, they're going to have some tough games during the cold, cold months, particularly down here in Sydney. Um, they got lapped at Brookie. Let's be honest. Yeah, they did, but that happened. That can happen to anyone, mate. That can happen to anyone, and and their depth is going to be tested at different times. So, um, I wouldn't be too concerned about that. It's uh, it's all just wondrous to have them in the competition at the moment, and wherever they finish this year, they've already been a raging success. So, I'm not bursting their bubble by any stretch. They'll bounce back. How good your photo with Wayne Bennett? You look like two giggling schoolboys together. Had to, had to interview him pre-game. It was great. We didn't talk about the game. No, you didn't. No. Yeah. Just talked about his season. He's very proud of what he's done up there. He's been great. Did say somewhere that he was being considered for the Hall of Fame? Was it, is that uh, right? An immortal. That, an, so an the immortal. question's being posed, do you change the criteria of the immortals to allow Wayne Bennett? 
I you think the Hall of Fame is the place for him. I, oh, I think, I think the Immortals is the players. Yeah. yeah. He's in the Hall of Fame now, isn't he? He'd have to be. I don't know. Well, he'd have to be. I don't know. Which one is Ray Warren in? Hall of Fame. Hall of Fame. See, that's, yeah. Coaches and media people. I think the Hall of Fame is a great recognition for anyone in the game that's had long service and distinguished service, and that's where Wayne Bennett belongs. The Immortals is a, I think that's a player, a player thing. Wayne Bennett wouldn't want the immortal criteria changed to allow him to be inducted. I mean, he, he's been... You've worked with him on immortal inductions. Well, I we were, don't think we were actually on the immortals committee last time um, when they wanted to have another two inductees. We put five through. We put mm, three yeah. three pre-war players through that should have been done originally because I don't think the original criteria was actually... Um, I think if they had their time over, they would have included pre-war people. But um, yeah, yeah, I think yeah. we did a good thing. Did a very that good night. job. Stefano Utoikamanu is the biggest Blues bolter of the last twenty years. Yes. Probably, it's hard to think of one bigger bolter at the moment. Where's that come from? Now he's been in camp for the last couple of years. Well, he was a project he, player, really. He was he was nineteenth man. He's obviously come under their attention. He's obviously a favourite with them. Uh, he's come under their attention. He's he was nineteenth man in Adelaide because I usually get the first flight out in the morning to come home and work, and he was getting the first flight out to come home for captain's run for the Tigers because yeah. they were playing on the Friday night. And um, actually spoke to him at the airport. I went out and helped him get a cab. Actually, he's uh, he's a big boy, big strong boy, nice kid too. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've watched his career come through and I've noticed that Brad Fittler's been keen to pick him in, uh, in development roles or certainly in encouragement roles mm. around the camp. So was I surprised? Probably not, knowing Brad Fittler. I wasn't that surprised, but I think... What does that mean, knowing Brad Fittler? What, 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 what didn't surprise you about well, that? Well, Brad, Brad Fittler spent a lot of time in the pathways for New South Wales. When Brad Fittler left club coaching uh, in his time at the Roosters, he went back into the Pathways program with the New South Wales Blues and uh, he was looking at 16s and 18s and a lot of the kids that that are coming through or playing for New South Wales now, Brad's had a long association with them. He's known them for a long time and he's he's kind of always, you know, not so much looked after, but he's always um, recognised the players that played in those junior rep teams and uh, who he saw as future representative players they have what they call an emerging blues mm. camp or emerging blues squads and you now we play 16s and 18s which is now 17s and 19s i think uh, with the with the junior rep teams but um he's kind of stuck pretty loyal to them and stefano's just i guess for most people that came out of left field but not so much for me i think you know i went oh well that's bradley that's that's what he does you know so Mm. Um, it's a big ask. Oh, is it what? Our history with New South Wales is littered with rookies going to Suncorp Stadium and, you know... Not um, coming back. Finding out that it's a it's a different planet. He's played 46 NRL games. Yep. He's won 12. And he's in an origin team. Yep. That needs to win to keep the series alive. It's a big, big ask. I'm not sure what his role will be. Uh, I, I don't know. Um whether they intend to sit him on the bench and bring him on at some stage or maybe start him so the nerves don't get Gee. too big sitting there on the bench and you don't want him to go out there when the game is half lost or in they're, they're in trouble, I guess. Mm. Um, it'll be interesting to see whether or not he starts or, or comes from the bench, but it's a lot of confidence shown by the coach and he obviously knows him better than me or anyone else that I know, so... Uh, he's he's put him in there. Um, Seems a mature kid, but gee, I, I know he, he's a lovely kid. Mm. Lovely kid. Um, had a good talk to him at the airport, and uh, he's a lovely kid. Um, really, and seems very very level headed too. He was quite appreciative and humble by the fact that he'd been down with the Origin team, and I'm not sure whether he was suspecting he was ever going to get a run, but I guess you're hopeful if you're down there. You you got one foot in the door. Um, you know, I probably started that as an Origin coach back in the early 2000s, bringing kids in for camps. I'd Remember a young Kurt Gidley and a young Luke Lewis and um, mm. a couple of players that I brought in at different times and it's sort of a bit of a tradition that all the coaches have carried on since then. I think it's important to give them a taste of the, the origin environment and how teams are prepared and um, so that when they come in it's it's not all totally new to them but Stefano 
That's, uh, Could have blown Sun- me over when I read that one. Suncorp Stadium will be something that he's never experienced, and he's going to be a wonderful experience for him. I hope it's a, a pleasant one. Last question that segues nicely into our discussion. A win for New South Wales in Game 2 at Suncorp Stadium would be the state's greatest ever triumph. Yeah, let's say that. Let's let's get on the bandwagon here. We need a Blues win. We need to come back to Sydney for a decider. Blues under all sorts of pressure. All the Queenslanders are chirping away. They're great winners, aren't they? They're fair dinkum. <laughs> they're bad losers and they're even worse winners. <laughs> so they're chirping away. They've had the win and bagging the selectors and bagging the players. And they all want to pick our team for a typical Queensland response. Wayne Bennett wanted to pick the team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. let's take advice off Wayne. Let's take advice off all the other Queenslanders that won't have a shot. Fatty. Do you know what strikes me about this? Yeah. This scenario that New South Wales faces is the precise scenario that the Queenslanders normally revel in. Written off, downtrodden, players unavailable. This would be the scenario that Queensland would go in and think, and would be likely to come out and win with. Trust me, Matthew, by the time next Wednesday night comes around, Queensland will believe they're underdogs. <laughs> oh, they not even they could sell this one. It doesn't work for them unless they are. It doesn't work for them unless they're underdogs. So by next Wednesday, they'll have claimed the underdog tag. <laughs> Oh, that would be a great effort. Yeah. But as a, as a New South Wales team, how do you channel or ha- how do you develop some of that Queensland mentality this week? Like the siege mentality, because they're right, but they're right up against it here. But you know what I mean? Like so many times, 95, 2020, any, as so many other scenarios, Queensland have been in this exact situation and come out to win. Yeah, New, New South Wales have done it too, but it's never celebrated the way Queensland celebrated. You know, Queensland have obviously had their great moments and it's part of it's part of origin history. It's part of origin folklore. It's what origin is. It's why we have the origin. It's where it all started. So it's a, a tradition with them and it's it's always celebrated and it's always played up, probably more dynamic than it really was. And But that's part of the theatre that comes with origin. It's all about Queensland. Origin is all about Queensland. New South Wales just play the part of the other team. It's all about Queensland. Everything is about Queensland for origin. So it, these sort of things are played up when they have extraordinary results, and they've had plenty. But New South Wales have had plenty of extraordinary results over the year. Plenty of backs to the wall wins. Plenty of times where they've pulled it out. Uh, plenty of last-minute wins. Yeah, so, but they're not celebrated the way Queensland Can you are. think of any? Yeah, I can. Plenty. Can you? I'm not going to give you any artillery for it, though. Right. No, plenty of times. So, and and this, is, this is an opportunity for these young players to do something really special in origin history. As I say, history is littered with these great stories, and you grow up following it, and you grow up listening to it, and you grow up wondering, and then you, you, you think, gee, I'd love to be there. Am I good enough? Would it? And then your time comes, crikey, do I belong here? I mean, you know, can I get this done? And, and all of a sudden, here's an opportunity. It's not, it's not just the, the pressure or, or what's about to unfold in the next week and a half to get ready for this game and to, and to level the series and win the game, but these players will not understand, they will not understand the importance of this in their career and in their life for another 20 years. They will not, if they can win this game, they will not understand how that will then be etched into origin history. And we'll talk about this. They talk about it more if you're a Queenslander, but New South Wales, it'll be something they can be really proud of in years to come. And when you say, how do they prepare a team for it like this? This is why a lot of the ex-Origin players go back to coach. This is why they all want to still be involved because, you know, your Brad Fittlers and your Greg Alexanders and whoever else is in the camp there, your Paul McGregors or your you know, Paul Sirenins and Danny players Baderas. that they bring in, Danny Baderas and players they bring in from different eras, they've all experienced this. They've all experienced Queensland doing it and what it feels like. They've all experienced New South Wales doing it and what it feels like. They all experience repelling Queensland when Queensland are in this mood and what they're doing. They've all experienced pressure. This is the ultimate pressure test for an end, for for a professional rugby league football. It's the ultimate pressure test. Mm. There is no bigger test than this. Going to to Suncorp Stadium to play Queensland as an underdog to either level the series or as to, or to win a series. And now, New South Wales have got it right throughout history a number of times, but they've got it wrong a hell of a lot more. You know, and as I say, we we. we it's never really celebrated when New South Wales have a back to the, the war win, but you'll remember it'll be something, a real feather in your cap. It'll be a badge of honour if, if these players can pull themselves together and win this. And it's a game of football. 
you know, if you can ignore what happens outside the sidelines and the try lines and everyone else's opinion and what the crowd might do and what the atmosphere might do and what the game score is and what happens, if we can ignore, ignore all that and just play this game between the try lines and the sidelines and, and execute 80 minutes of football as it should be played at this level and eke out a win, it'll be one of their greatest achievements. You know, so let's celebrate it. If they do win, it'll be New South Wales' greatest achievement in history. But there have been others. So does the, the potential to create legacy and a legendary win, does that take centre stage in preparation? It's like winning golf majors. It's like scoring test centuries at cricket. It's like, you know, like... It's, it, there does are th- Freddie put that up in lights this week? We're, we're climbing Everest here. Like, I, would that be something you'd embrace as coach? I don't know what Freddie's motivation will be. The, the game doesn't need motivation. No. That, that's, that's, not, that's not the key here. The key is not motivation. That's the easiest part of, of coaching in these games is the motivation. What, needs, what they need assistance with is the steel. They, they need assistance with um, what it's going to be like and, and when the pressure test comes, which comes from the first minute to the 80th minute, and, mm. and, and with that's going to come scoreboard pressure and result pressure during the course of the game, but can I ignore that and just do my job next job? No matter what happened previously, can I do the next job and do it to the utmost of my ability? Could I keep getting up and doing it, whether I'm tired, whether I'm busted, whether I'm hurt? You know, whether I'm playing out of position, you know, like all the things that could happen to them during the course of this 80 minutes, the ultimate test. How do I deal with that? So it's not motivation. It's it's the attitude control to keep performing and, and to, to treat the next play as the most important play in the game. I often talk to them about, um, you know, at the end of the game, all us commentary experts can go back and tell you the turning point. This was the most significant point in the game. This was the turning point in the game. That's the play that decided the contest. That's the one that turned the, 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 the win in the favour of, of this team. You know, we, we, we all know after the game when that moment is going to come. No one knows before the game when it's going to be. No one knows which play is going to be the different one. So we have to treat every play as though that could be the one. Because mm. the, the one time we don't treat it like that, it could be the one that loses it for us. So... When you, when you roll back, when you find that turning point in the game, I used to say this, you find that turning point in the game. So we'll sit there, you know, your Andrew Johns and your Cameron Smiths and everyone will sit there after the game and say, well, that was the turning point. That was the big point in the game. That's where the game was won and lost. All right, go to that point and then roll the tape back 10 seconds. Just roll it back 10 seconds and see where everyone was 10 seconds before that play, 10 seconds before that turning point and see who moved first. And you'll find more often than not, everyone had equal opportunity to be there, but someone moved first. Someone mm. saw it first and someone went for it first. And someone got left a half a yard behind. And I used to have this call, a half a yard, make up your half a yard now. Make that half a yard up now. Plenty of blokes scoring tries and you're half a yard away from grabbing him or you're half a yard away from getting the loose ball or you're half away from catching the kick or whatever it is. And that's, you go, take it back 10 seconds, he moved first. He was more desperate. He was quicker to the ball. He was braver. He had more courage. He anticipated. And that's that's the test of origin. It's going to come down to those little moments during the course of the game. And a lot of them will will even out. A lot of them, they'll get there and they'll compete for the 50-50 ball and they'll even out. But there'll be one or two in the game that actually decide the, the fate of the team. So when's that going to come? You don't know. We know after the game. We don't know before the game. So every moment's going to be important. Every play is going to be important. That's why you've got to get up when you're hurt. You've got to keep running when you're tired. That's why you've got to forget the drop ball that just happened and, and get on with the next play. You've got to forget that you just missed the tackle. You've got to forget your shoulder's aching and here they come at me again. And Well, the last time this black ran at me, he put his elbow on my throat and now I've got to go up there and tackle the ball again. You know, will he do it again? Like, there are all these little battles, these mental battles that go on during the course of the game, you know, and up goes the high ball. I just dropped the last one. Here comes Hammerser. You know, like, I've got to be under this one. You know, there's all these little mental tests. And that's why they're the best. That's why they're the best players. That's why this is the badge of honour, to play at this level and be tested like that and and come through it and win. And, you know, and the, the truly great ones that do it time and time and time and time again are just so elite. I can't emphasise that enough. The elite, long-serving origin player who consistently proves himself time and time is such an elite individual. He's, he's they're, just, they're just off the Richter scale. It's It's... it's such a great brand of football and such a wonderful test. So to to steel yourself to do that, and it's easy to say before the game you're going to do it, you go into it with all good intention, but that good intention will be tested so many times during the course of the contest. It will be tested by a number of things. 
there, there are plenty of things that are going to test your resolve and test your commitment. You start the game with all good intention, but that good intention will be tested. You start the same, I will, I will, come, up, I will come up with the right thought at the right time, but that's going to be tested. And that's, that's the ultimate test. That's what it is. So it's not motivation you need. Mm. It's, it's help with the process you're about to go through mentally you know, to, to meet the challenges that this game is about to offer. And it doesn't matter if you've done it 10 times before, you've got to do it again. You've got to prove yourself over and over and over. Every time they hand you an Origin jersey, you need to prove yourself to be an Origin player again. doesn't matter how many you've played. And mm. the, the great ones do it time and time and time again. Some only play one game, some only play 10 minutes. Some Origin players in history have only had, you know, but... I say it's a badge of honour. If someone picked you and thought you were in the best 17 to play for your state at that time, then it's a badge of honour. There's a lot, a lot of players that never even got that far. Um, but if you can do it a few times and prove yourself at that level, it's they're, they're the elite of the elite. Love it. Yep. The Blues have got to scrap for everything. That's what Queensland do. Again, it's the, it's the, it's the Queensland again, scenario. Again, we celebrate it when Queensland do it. We don't necessarily congratulate New South Wales when they do it, but there are plenty of times in history when New South Wales do. Mm. We've had plenty of courageous players, plenty of great wins, plenty of backs-to-the-wall efforts, plenty of you know, written off and, and, and still got it done. But um, uh, you know, it's nowhere near celebrated enough. Mm. Daly Cherry Evans fired a bit of a shot across the bows yesterday, said club footy doesn't win at origin level, and Mitchell Moses has to find. If you were coaching Moses this week, what would you be looking for? I'm looking for his origin performance. But what would you be looking for come game time? What do you want out of him? I just want him to be himself. I just want him to come to the game and play the game. Not wait for invitation, not wait for you know circumstance, not wait for the perfect moment. He has to impose himself on the game, and he does that with the skills that he uses week in, week out. Daly Cherry Evans is right. Origin football is, is very different to club football, but it's still, that's the talent you come with, you know, and it's it's one thing when players are rookies or have been given a big job, and, you know, it's the job of the coach and the people around him to say, you're born to do this. This is this is where you're meant to be at this time. This is why you're here, and this is what this is what's going to get you through. It's it's still the same stuff you do at origin level, at club level, but it's just a, a different level. And it's, you know, and it's the game. I, m- I remember back in, in the 80s when I was playing first grade football and I didn't play origin, but I played with and against a lot of fellas who did. And it was described to me by a player once. He said, it's the game you always wanted to play in. You know, he said, it's just the game you always wanted, you always dreamt of playing in, of how tough something could be, how competitive, uh, how much pressure. He said, it's... and you know, it's um, it's it's a it's a remarkable product. It's a remarkable test. You know, of coaches and players, and it's so high profile, and um, it's you know it's really on a pedestal, and I think all players see it that way. So, and those that have succeeded often put pressure on players like this by saying things that Daly Cherry Evans has said. Daly Cherry Evans has proven in the environment. He's got to prove it again. Every time you go out, you've got to prove it. But Daly Cherry Evans is using whatever advantage he can to say to Mitchell Moses, it ain't going to cut it, mate. Whatever your best has been up till now, it ain't going to cut it. You're going to have to be better than that. Than that. And Mitchell Moses will. But he's, he's going to, he gets the opportunity to show what he's got. Mm. And I said prior to the selection of this team, if I was selecting the team, I would have gone with Mitchell Moses. I had no influence or suggestion or anything on the selection. But as, as the week went on and contenders were given their opportunity for one last audition, mm. there was one that stood out head and shoulders on the weekend above all else. So if you're looking for someone that's going to stand up to the moment and take his chance, uh, everyone had their opportunity on the weekend. Mitchell Moses, by far and away, handled it the best. And I guess that's what won him the selection. I'd imagine, well, I do know that Brad Fittler and Greg Alexander were out at Acor Stadium on Saturday specifically to watch him play. And they got the answer that they were looking for, I guess, because mm. later that night he was announced as the Origin halfback. Um, Daly Cherry Evans, he's right. He's absolutely right. Mitchell mm. Moses, he needs to come up with a response. And it's no good talking to him about it. He's got to get out and do it. Mm. Played a grand final last year, but it's a, it's a step up again for Mitchell Moses, who gets a second uh, New South Wales well, it, jersey. It's, it, it's helpful from that respect because... Um, I, I, I think that was his first grand final. Yep. Uh, first and only grand final. And I think the pain of defeat is a tremendous teacher 
it's a you know um i think the pain of actually getting to a state of a grand final and then understanding actually how important it is post game and losing teaches you how important a grand final is because you don't get there all that often <clears throat> if you don't get success with the thing it's it's a pain that you'll carry with you forever um and i think the pain of that is great preparation for what he's about to experience up there at Suncorp Stadium. He won't want to come home a loser. He won't want to go and fail at this at this opportunity. The last time he played an Origin game, I think it was a dead rubber. Clear, he got injured after the second game. He came in and New South Wales weren't at their best. And you know, I thought he was quite good, you know, for a first game. But um, things didn't go his way on the scoreboard. But I think um, I think losing the grand final last year, if he wants to draw on that experience to find that little bit extra that he's going to need on this occasion, losing a grand final will sharpen you up mm. as to your preparation and what needs to happen. And, you know, you, you don't want that losing fe- feeling at the end of it. And it's no good being a, a sad loser afterwards. Show me you're a sad loser during the game. Show me how bad a loser you are while the game's on. Don't show it to me slumping in the dressing room having a silk. Do, mm. it, do it there on the field. Show me what a bad loser you are out there. That's where you need to show it. He's a competitor, Moses. He really is. He is. And well, the, the, I guess the, the knock on him has been over the years that he can float in and out of games. He's going to have to. He's going to have to be there. For well, him. I wish he'd have floated out of the game on Monday. Yeah, well, he didn't do that, did he? No. But, but he's, he's, he's put more consistent football together the older he gets. He's a good player, mate. Yeah. He's, he's he's always been a good player, and he's got a brilliant kicking game. He's totally suited to Origin and what this team is going to need. He's quick. He brings he brings teammates to life. He he gets his team on the front foot. He takes the bruises out of the game with his long kicking game. He's prepared to kick early. He's prepared to kick long. He's got all the different types of kicks that he can do. Um, he's he's got all the tools he needs to be successful at this level. You know, New South Wales were looking for a halfback for many years. How many times did we change our halfback? We brought in rookies, we brought in young blokes, we brought in old blokes, we brought blokes back from retirement. We did all sorts of things to get the halves combination for New South Wales until Nathan Cleary came in and made it his own. And I remember the first call I got from uh, from Greg Alexander. That they, they wanted to pick Nathan Cleary, and he was very young. And I said, on one condition, you pick him, you stick, you stick with him. Or two conditions, so you stick with him, and you stick with him for four or five years, I said, because he'll get it done for you. And the other stipulation was you take James Maloney with him in that first year, which they did. Um, but Nathan Cleary has made the number seven jersey his own. You know, Had Nathan Cleary not come along, it could well have been Mitchell Moses. Mm. You know, but Nathan Cleary got the jump and, and made the position his own, and he's our halfback for New South Wales and will be for the next you know, however many years. But had he not come along, Mitchell Moses could easily have been that player. Easily, and and could easily have done a good job. So, um, you know, it's only his second one, and he comes late in his career. But he's got all the tools needed to win. I believe that. Talk about earn yourself a spot, Reese Robson. Well, he had the way he's played, it's an irresistible case. And indeed, they've they've changed tact a little bit too, because it, in game one they went without the specialist hooker on the bench. Yep. There's now two hookers in that 17-man squad. Yeah. Well. Go up to the Cowboys establishment at the moment and ask all the players up there who's the player who's the player you most like to play with. I bet yeah, he gets the majority of the votes. Yeah. You yeah. know, that's that's your man. You know, yeah. it's it's um and he's put in origin tight performances at the club level for a long for a long time now. It's very consistent and um he'll be tough enough, he'll be good enough. How they're going to use him I don't know. Bit of Marley might start. Maybe. Instead of Cook. Can you well. see that? Take the sting out, bring Cook in. I can see that, but you know, they need to make that decision early in the week so everyone knows what they're doing. They need to have their strategy right, whatever that strategy is, and whether that means Stefano starts or whether it means you know Cook's on the bench or however they want to play it. But um, the plan needs to be clear right from the get-go and understand why we're doing this and then go out and execute it. It's a 17-man game origin. Everyone plays their part, and... You need to have a plan, and you need to stick to it. Then there's the old rule. Everyone has a plan until they get hit on the chin. Well, <laughs> you're going to get hit on the chin. So yeah. you need you need to really believe in what you're doing, and then you need to trust each other and trust yourself to get it done when it's needed. And mm. they're the sort of players you want to pick. Robson, cool. Robson, I think, is unflappable. I think he's, he's bulletproof in that regard. I don't think there's anything in his game that can be upset or... Uh, put off by the opposition. I think the tougher the better. And he mm. looks well suited to Origin. Just 
the problem for him is when, when and how he gets into the game. Um, and I think there was a concern there that Damien Cook couldn't go the 80 minutes. Um, I don't know about that. but um, When you say not go the 80 minutes, do you think he, he can't go the 80 minutes and maintain his zip? Is that what you mean? Yeah, all that. Yeah. Or, you know, whether he's... You know, he's shown them in the past that he he loses. You know, they can they work it out by their GPS and their yeah. data and their tackle rates and all sorts of things. It's all too tricky for me, but um, yeah, they'll they'll have had a reason why they wanted to cover Hooker from the bench on this occasion. I'm a little worried we don't have a halves replacement. I I would have pumped for Nico Hines on the bench. I think I think right at the moment that's the perfect place for Nico Hines on the bench for New South Wales. It was just unfortunate. You know, that in game one, he had to be used in probably the one position that you didn't want to have to use him. He had to go out and play in the centres, and um, it didn't go well at the back end of the game for New South Wales, and, and that was unfortunate. Um, you know, but he can certainly cover fullback half, five, eight. He could cover lock forward. I think he could cover dummy half. Nico Hines would have been my selection on the bench, but for some reason, those internally have felt they needed the two hooker model, um, and that's what they're going to go with. Now, Queensland tend to start with Ben Hunt and then they bring Harry Grant on after that and Harry Grant comes on and everything lifts and takes intensity and spark. If you wanted to replicate that for New South Wales, well then maybe Robson does start and mm. Damien Cook comes from the bench. That would seem like for like, but you know, do you want to do it like Queensland or maybe go the other way around? Maybe get out there and get Damien Cook out there, try to get to the front early and then you know, bring Robson on later when Harry Grant's running amok in the middle of the field and mm. you're looking for defence and, and all of that. Up. So mm. it's... It's, it's How good's Origin, Gus? It's an interesting hey? tactical ploy. I love talking Origin. I hate talking You love it. it. Oh, a, look, you get warmed up and you just keep going and going. It's no, good. No. The longer this game goes, the better for Gus. He just gets stronger and stronger. Last one on the Blues. I think Liam Martin, most people thought he'd start. Do you reckon that head knock, he's been named on the bench? Do you, do you think that head knock has maybe taken... No. So he may, he may come in? He'll be right. And the, the, we've been discussing this a lot in the last few weeks. Um, the protocols for return to play and return to train are pretty strict. I don't know how much physical activity he'll be permitted to have pre-game. I mean, the 11 days runs out on the Wednesday. I think he can, from what I read, he can only do contact work at the captain's run. Yeah, well, that's... So contact you know, work's not really that, a problem for Lee that, Martin. That's hardly a great preparation. What I would have tried to have done was to get that reduced... Um, I don't know whether they're going down that line at, at all, but uh, we experienced the same probably with uh, Reed Marnie last week. Reed Marnie, as you know, was stood down for 11 days. He met the criteria to have that shortened. He was able to play in eight days uh, for the Bulldogs against Parramatta on Monday. In reflection, when he got the clearance on the Friday night, because the protocols are so strict, he hadn't actually had a week's preparation leading into the game. He hadn't been able to do the physical work. He hadn't been able to do the contact work. And all these sorts of things are about timing and repetition and muscle memory. And 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 we sort of raised the question amongst ourselves, well, even though he's been cleared, do we play him? Not that we feared the head knock or the concussion side of that because he'd been cleared of all of that. But had he had the proper physical preparation to go into Monday's game, ready for that that's going to be the first time of the week where he actually has contact people have got to come and watch these sides train and watch what they go through during the course of the week and what they put themselves through they're not just playing on weekends it, it, there's a physical preparation and a mental preparation that the players have to go into so if Liam Martin can't do contact work until the day before the game that is not an ideal preparation for any game let alone an origin Knowing Liam Martin as I, I have, if anyone can overcome that, it's him. And if anyone's getting up at 2 o'clock in the morning going down the park and tackling telegraph poles, it'll be Liam Martin <laughs> to get himself ready. <laughs> they don't move very well. <laughs> they move when he hits them, baby. <laughs> oh, how good is he? They move when he hits them. Oh, yeah, he, yeah. He's a, he was brilliant against the, uh, against the Roosters too. Yeah, but it, it's, it's been a talking point with, with, with clubs um, mm. around that as well. And, and we also have different rules around New South Wales Cup players and NRL players, it's all got to be sorted out at the moment. But, um, yeah, the, the protocols around return to play are restrictive and sometimes the, it's not it's not the concussion part of it. They've passed the concussion protocols. There's no danger of, of worrying about that or any, you know, but it's it's then the physical preparation and the mental preparation to actually play. So I'm not sure if there I'd is an application in to shorten that, by the way. I'd, Im I'd imagine they've got all that in in train though but he, he's a very important part he nearly turned the game from well he did turn the game from when he came on last time yeah 
uh, whether he starts the game and which side of the field he plays, I, I'm not too sure. Okay, uh, for Queensland, Xavier Coates replaces Selwyn Cobbo. He might have been a little unlucky to miss in the first place, Xavier Coates. He's been in tremendous form. Jeremiah Nene, after his successful return, starts in the back row for Tom Gilbert. The one that I that caught my eye is Foto Waker on the bench. Now he's a he's a genuine effort player. You got you got Cotter and Foto Waker. Now Cotter started last time and may do the same thing again, but it shows Billy's preference for effort players. Foto Waker coming into the lineup. Yeah, I think Queensland's stronger. I said that on a hundred percent footy the other night. You know, and that's nothing against the players that went out because they did a great job and they won an origin game and they were terrific. But my sense is that the players that come in actually bring more to the table, a little bit more versatility, a little bit more strike, uh, with with the equal amount of, of effort areas and and um, and work ethic as the players that have gone out. I think Queensland are stronger for their inclusion. That's nothing against the players that have that have gone out. I just think with Fadawaka and uh, Xavier Coates and Jer- especially Jeremy Nene, mm. um, I think they bring a different skill set. And I think it makes Queensland more dangerous. I think there's more points in this Queensland side now. And I think there's more creativity. I think I, I just think there's more. The, the, the first team was a typical origin effort team, Queensland team. I think this one brings just a little bit more. I, I think mm-hmm. they're stronger. And they're going to be much stronger because it's Suncorp State. New South Wales are way up against it. Way up against it. Can't win you. Queensland are clear favourites in this, but as I said by kickoff, they'll think they're underdogs. <laughs> they have got no hope of claiming underdog status. Not even Fatty could do that mm. this week. No well, we've had some very dark nights up there when Queensland get it right, and uh, I think this is a very, very formidable Queensland team who are right on top of their game uh, and everything in their favour. Absolutely everything in their favour. And. From a New South Wales perspective, you won't want to hear this, but Billy Slater has the opportunity to win a second Origin Series in the space of five games as coach. Mm-hmm. He's lost one game. Mm-hmm. He could be four and one after this. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's not bad for a bloke who'd never coached before. Mm-hmm. So that's where it's at. Origin 2, exclusive live and free here on 9. On uh, Wednesday, seven days away. Set your clock to it. Now, we'll have a little break here, then we'll come back and look at some club some club news. Uh, on the way to the break, six tackle trivia. You cannot get this. Great question from Jordan. Reese Robson will become the fourth North Queensland Cowboy to play for New South Wales. Can you name the other three? While you're thinking about this, the new doco, The King, will be aired on 9 and 9 now the day before Origin, just to get Queensland even more revved up. (laughs) Tuesday, June 21. Here is a sneak listen to what you will get on this super documentary. And our team here at Wobble to Sports has done an amazing job. The King, Tuesday, June 21, to get you revved up for Game 2. Sometimes I used to Wally watch. That's how good he was. He'd sit and fight front rowers. Can you believe the state of he was like a, a movie star to me. Oh, he was the boss. He's always been the boss. Well, I've never spoken publicly about it. We need a new captain. I got a little bit dirty about it. Just said I, I suffer from epilepsy. <laughs> when he hit me in the throat, I could not breathe. Lewis in trouble. His impact on origin footy, it's hard to fathom. He was an arrogant prick. And I think he thrived on the fact that he was hated. Reese Robson will become the fourth North Queensland Cowboy to play for New South Wales. Can you name the other three? Crikey. The front row, McLean? No, he got injured. I, I Remember? Got in, I That's got what injured. I thought. Okay. James Tamo, did he play? One. Did Luke O'Donnell play? Two. Him? You are a million to one to get the third one. Wait on. I got a dollar in my pocket. <laughs> um, uh, I'd love to give you this hint. If I did, I think you'd get it. No, but I won't for the moment. Don't, 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 don't. North Queensland player who played for New South Wales in 2000. You were a coach, weren't you? No. No. Uh, 
2000, they won. That was Wayne Pierce's mob. Didn't they? You had coached. You had okay. You have you have coached him in Origin. I have coached him in Origin. Yeah. So he'd obviously come from New South Wales to play with the Cowboys. Uh huh. I coached him in Origin. He played in 2000. I can't believe he was still playing Origin in 2000. Oh. He played a lot of Origin football. Wow. Mm. Played a lot of Origin football. Yep. From North Queensland. Played a lot of Origin football. Right, finished his career there, yeah? Yep. Finished who'd he his play career. For, who'd he play for? Oh, if I told you that, you'd get it. No. He was fast. He was a back. He was fast. Particularly when he was younger. Fast when he was younger. He played fullback for him. For yeah. Cowboys. Played fullback for you too. Played fullback for me. Yep. Played fullback for me. Yep. It's a good one, isn't it? It's not Tim Brasher. Yes, it's Tim Brasher! <laughs> Did he play for North Queensland? Yeah. Did he? Yeah. All oh, right. How about that? Gussie! Yeah. Tim Brasher. Eddie would have had you locked into an answer a minute ago. Yeah. Well done. Yeah. And, uh, it's funny, I said McLean, but remember he got, he got picked last year and got he hurt, got poor bloke. He got hurt. Yeah. I thought, yeah, Luke O'Donnell was the hard one, I thought. Well, but no, Tim, Tim Brasher was Tim, the hard Brasher, one. Tim Brasher was the hard one, well, yeah. <laughs> I, I, thought, I thought Luke O'Donnell, James Tarmow, and, and um, Luke O'Donnell, and, mm-hmm. and, and Jordan McLean, McLean. Mm-hmm. they were the three. I was, I was half the confident. When you said McLean, I remember mm-hmm. now he got injured, he didn't play. Well done. He was a beauty at Origin, Tim Brasher, wasn't he? He was a beauty. He wasn't even playing, when we first picked him for Origin back in the 90s, he wasn't even playing fullback for his club at that time, I don't think, Balmain. Really? I think he was playing in the centres. Uh, he was only a young fella. So had he played fullback before Origin? I don't think so. I, well, I can't wow. remember about his junior football, but I'm pretty sure he was playing in the centres for Balmain and he played fullback for us. Or he might have just started with Balmain. I think, I'm right. pretty sure once he started playing fullback for New South Wales, he went to fullback for the Tigers. What made you pick him at fullback? Oh, it's a long time ago, yeah. mate. But he was he was brilliant at it. He, yeah. was, he was really good. Um, yeah, E.T. had played a bit of fullback at that time. It was kind of like, it wasn't uncommon in those days that they played him out of position in yeah. origin level. Um, I wanted big, strong wingers. I think um, Rod Wishart was a favourite of mine. Graham uh, Mackay? Graham Mackay was a favourite of mine. And those we we wanted big strong wingers and and Tim Brusher was great. He was quick, scored some good, really good tries. Good player. But you know, you talk about great New South Wales fullbacks now, Teddy obviously and Minicello. But geez, he he was a tremendous servant of New South Wales. Oh, Tim brilliant! Brusher. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely brilliant. Yeah, we won ninety two, ninety three, ninety four. We were the first New South Wales side to ever win three Origin series in a row, and uh, he was a an integral part of that team. Mm. He's a favourite of the Balmain faithful as well. Tim Brasher, well done. Um, the Dragons have gone for experience over fresh ideas. Shane Flanagan, he'll be the coach. They're trying to work out how long he's going to be there for, but he'll become the club's fourth full-time head coach since they won the comp in 2010. Mm. It's been a tough time for the Dragon, hasn't it, over that period of time? He's actually been there in a couple of roles. He was assistant coach there. I think he went there and assisted Paul McGregor at one stage and then... Uh, he was doing some recruitment work, um, I think, when Anthony Griffin was still there mm-hmm. and then took up the assistant's job over at Manly. But um, he's obviously experienced. He's a premiership winning head coach and gets his opportunity now to resume his career as a head coach with the Dragon. It's a very important time in their history. Um, he's got a history of setting up good pathways and development um, at, at the Sharks in his time there. Um uh, but, you know, there's, there's a long road ahead of them. I, I keep saying Dragons are mm. a lot better side than where they're placed on the ladder, and they showed that last week. when they, they, I mean, South were under strength, but they did beat them comfortably, and I can see plenty of more wins in the Dragons between now and the end of the season. So uh, it's a good job for... I said it was a great job for a head coach. It's a, it's a good job to get, and uh, um, and the Dragon, we, we need them to be strong. It's an important brand in our competition. Out of interest... It- Obviously, Anthony Seabold is. When he signed on to assist Anthony Seabold, one of the criteria was that I might get a full time job. So, and he's he's endorsed him to do that. If the Dragons could get Flanagan now, should they should they throw him in? 
But yeah, would mate. there be a reason not to? No, no reason at all. Other than, you know, we should sort of be leaving Manly in the lurch a little bit at this stage of the season. Um, they've still got the most important part of the year in front of them. And mm. they just bounced back to winning form last week. So, they, no, really, that's on... That'll be on the Dragons and it'll be on the head coach. But if they could tick off on all of that, if Manly were happy, would you be, if, would if, you be happy to have him in there? I think I think if if I was Shane Flanagan, I'd want to start straight away. Yeah, yeah. I'd want to, or, or at least be there witnessing how it was. You didn't necessarily have to take over. I remember when I left Panthers to coach the Roosters back in uh, ninety. I coach. I started as head coach in ninety five, but I actually. I left the Roosters with about eight rounds to go. I left the Panthers with about eight rounds to go in the competition and went there and observed the Roosters for the back half of that season. And in fact, <laughs> I coached the last game for the Roosters in 1994. Um, the second last game, they got beaten 44-4 to four or something or other by Parramatta at Parramatta Stadium and the interim coach was Arthur Beach and he walked, he walked in and quit. He's not, <laughs> I'm not coaching him anymore. He said, <laughs> I'm done. And I was actually in the dressing room at that time and I'd been observing and setting up for next year and getting out. we had no staff and there was no assistant coaches in them days and I was trying to get a full-time strength and conditioning coach and I'd, I'd come up with Ronnie Palmer who was actually mm. with the Roosters at that time, part-time. And uh, I was standing in the dressing room in the old Parramatta Stadium and... Um, Arthur walked in and he was a bit disappointed and he said, he said oh, I'm not coaching this anymore. He said, Big Arthur, he walked out and Nick Pilatus turned around me. He said, uh, you're on next week, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I had to coach the last game of the season. How'd you go? We won. Did you? Yeah. We won. Funny funny enough, we co- we played the Gold Coast and the, my last game I'm coaching for the Panthers was the Gold Coast. Oh, so right. I did. The same thing there, but it was a it was a funny week because. Do you know you're going good with the interim coach quits? It was it was actually it was it was actually a game, it was actually a game for the for the wooden spoon. I think, oh, yeah, I think we, um, yeah, it was a game they needed to win, and um, I went I went in and uh, they had a, they had a pretty good under twenty threes time at the t- team at the time. I think they might have been minor premiers that year, and I, I went into the coach. I said, "Give us your four best kids." He swore down. I'm going to play them in first grade this week for a bit of experience. Give us your four best kids. Um, and I played them in first grade, and then the first grade side, I went around and interviewed all the players and asked them what position. The funniest one was Tony. Oh, you told me Tony Ira. Tony Ira. Have I told that story? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a we'll funny, tell it again. It's a funny story. And I, I said that Tony Ira was playing for them, and um, I think he was playing on the wing or somewhere, and he, I went and sat him down. Lovely bloke, Tony. Love him. And he uh, was one of my favourite ever players, and I said... Um, what what what's what's your favourite position, mate? He said, oh, I don't know. I said, What do you mean you don't know? He said, oh, I don't know anymore. I don't know. <laughs> I said, Well, what's your best position? He said, oh, I don't know. I said, What? He said, I don't, I don't know. He said, I just don't know. He said, I've lost all confidence. He said, I just I don't know. I said, So you don't really know where you want to play? I said, Can you give me a hint? Where do I pick you? I said, I think you need to be in the team. Where do you? He said, I, I don't know. <laughs> I what said, an right. overwhelming conversation. <laughs> I said, all right. Well, this is our thing. I said, well, leave it to me. So um, we turned up for training the next day, and I named him in the program at fullback. He came and he said, fullback? <laughs> he said, yes, I've never played fullback in my life. I said, that's all right. You'll handle it. Fullback? He said, I can't play fullback. Why are you playing me fullback? <laughs> I said, well, I figured if you didn't know where you wanted to play, stand back there at fullback, watch all the other positions, and when you think you know which one you like, yell out, and I'll put you there. He said, you're mad. I said, you haven't seen half of it yet, but... <laughs> We went out and trained with Big Tony Iro at fullback. I think the first two they kicked him. One was along the ground. He fell over and went between his legs. And the next one was a bomb that went over his head, nearly even on the back of the head. And I think after about 10 minutes, he yelled out, second row. I said, up you go. I, moved what, him I thought he was a second row, wasn't he? Well, he wasn't at the time. Oh, I think he was, he was sort of dabbling a little. He was playing a little bit. Full he said, second row. <laughs> I said, right, I, I changed them all around. He went up and played in the second row. Hey, can you remember who the, the kids were from the under 23 that you picked? Yeah, um, there was a front rower called Adam Starr. Oh, yeah, he played a lot. Uh, there was a hooker called Robbie Mears. Yeah. There was a halfback called Jamie Shepherd. Is he the one that, that the coach? Yeah, yeah. he's the coach. Um, and I think there was one, uh, was it Scotty Hudson or, um, or it might have been the three of them. I think, yeah, I think they were the, I remember those three distinctly, and I apologise if there was four, but... Mm. I'm thinking Scotty Hudson or maybe someone like that, but I think I think they were the three. Yeah, right. Yeah. You used to see a bit of that, didn't you? Like, I suppose with like the the reserve situation, a lot of you used yeah. see a lot of blokes go from like twenty threes into first grade. Yeah, quick. yeah. So they, they they got belted by Parramatta forty four to four the, the previous week, and we 
we eked out a very narrow win over the Gold Coast. I think the crowd was 12. I don't think there was too many at the stadium to watch us play. And Tony I didn't play fullback. Uh, yeah, he did for 10 minutes. And he, and he didn't play <laughs> that was it, enough. He didn't play it very well either. <laughs> hey, on the subject of Roosters coaches, do you reckon Trent Robinson's faced a trickier scenario than this before? Um, yeah, there was a few years ago they ran last. Um, uh, or last or second last. Well, I, think they, they, I think they had like a, an, an epidemic of injuries. Yeah, and they had a couple of bad results. That, it, it happens every now and then. You know, you, you don't see... I don't think anyone saw this coming with the Roosters and this roster. I mean, it's a, a roster you can't jump over, but, um, you know, injuries, chemistry, something's not quite right there at the moment, and they're just finding it hard... I think I said on this program last week they they beat the Roosters they beat the Panthers uh, who were them who make Bulldogs they beat the Bulldogs by a point the week before mm. and I said I thought the Roosters were awful and I said Penrith will give it to them this week and they did well, they were no better on the weekend that was the easiest um, that was the least the most score was going to be I mean they really outclassed the Roosters and and that's unlike the Roosters they're not like that it's a it's a quality roster and quality team and they just they can't seem to get out of their own way at the moment but he'll he'll work it out. So, I took my youngest son to Allianz to watch that game. He's a Penrith right. fan. Great stadium, isn't it? I, I, I can't remember the last time I sat in the stand watching a game. Yeah, it's, right. The viewing experience there is second yeah. to none. Yeah. Just wonderful. Um, so, that's a positive. I've got to say, they, they look cumbersome, the Roosters. They look slow. They look slow. Slow and cumbersome. Nothing's happening quick. When, when the Roosters are at their best, they're, they're bristling. They're, they're running fast and hard onto the ball and... They seem so imposing. They're, they're, they're hard to contain and uh, they just overwhelm sides. That's how they used to play. Um, and they've just kind of... Mm. I don't know. They just don't have that... Well, Penrith had them covered all night. Oh, easily. Well, Penrith were in position could before have, the Roosters know where they, could knew have, where they could were going. Have, well, they beat them by 40, yeah. 48 or something points earlier this year and they just beat them. Um, uh, they, they just flogged them. Um, yeah, so... And and that happens, and that's where the Roosters are at the moment. And that's where the Panthers are at the moment. Panthers are clearly the premiership favourites again. You know, possible contenders are all falling, falling on to the side, and their defensive resolve is just getting them through, and they're getting yeah. their attack in order. And no Cleary, no problem. They just march on. Which brings you to a question, actually, from Tex on Ask Gus: What makes the Panthers' defence superior to the rest? Works on principles rather than uh, situations. It's uh, it's a complex answer to a simple question, isn't it? But um, that's as much as I can give away on that. Ooh. Why? Well, Have you got a non-disclosure agreement? Well, I t- took the defensive coach. Oh. Um, Fig Tree Matt, big supporter of the podcast. Thanks, Fig Tree Matt. On the back of the JWH versus Spencer Fracker, who are the biggest firecrackers you played with? Firecrackers? Yeah. Uh, Mark Bugden was a firecracker. <laughs> You can go off at the drop of a hat. <laughs> <laughs> um, firecrackers. Uh, did I firecrackers that I played with? Is but you know, even players you coached, I suppose. Anyone uh, you, Mark, anyone you Mark Guy was a firecracker. Oh, he was a firecracker. Yeah, I could tell you plenty of stories about Mark Guy. Um, Do you know he had the same crazy eyes as Spencer on the weekend too, Mark Guy, didn't he? When he got into a yeah. Push and shove. Yeah, he didn't glare at him. He just give it to him. <laughs> there was no, there was no staring competition with Mark. Um, yeah. yeah, he was, he was a firecracker. Who else? Um, there was a few. Would have been a few at Newtown, wouldn't they? Jack Hetherington was a firecracker. <laughs> He's calm now. Yeah. Uh, what do you got him all meditating well, there or something? Never. Tommy Rodonigas was a so, firecracker. Oh yes, that's true. He didn't need an invitation. He, he fight at the drop of a hat. Mm. Yeah, there was. There's been some firecrackers over the years. What are you done with Tavita and Jack? He got them. He got them breathing and meditating and yoga and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, no, Tavita's really good. Tavita, Tavita. Well, Jack's at Newcastle now, but you had yeah. him before. Tavita's discipline is really good now. Um, mm. He's playing good football. A bit disappointed he didn't make the Origin side, but um, hopefully he can go well for the Bulldog this weekend. Okay, Michael Mortimer, who I don't believe is a relation to the famous Mortimer footballing family, but great to hear from you, Michael. Any British players you'd like to see have a crack in the NRL? There's a couple of good ones coming out to play with Newcastle uh, that I'd shown some interest in. Um, uh, remember a player called Leon Price? Mm-hmm. His son is coming out to play for the yeah. Newcastle Knights. Another kid, um, a hyphenated name, what's his name? Um, 
Oh, I know it, but I can't think of it. Yeah. Um, he's coming out to play. They're, they're good players over there in the UK at the moment. I think most people are keeping their eyes on the St Helens halfback Dodd, Lewis Dodd. And Who's the fullback? Um, Wellsby. Yeah. Um, he's a good player. There's, there's always emerging players over there, but... Um, then you've got to you've got to relate that to the Australians that go there, that are amongst the best playing in the English Super League, and you, mm. then you're starting to think, well, what's the standard really like? Then you have the anomaly of St Helens coming out and beating um, you know, Panthers in the pre-season uh, Challenge Cup game. So it's it's hard to marry up the form some and who would be successful. History shows that a lot of the forwards that come out from England are very very successful and adapt very quickly. A little bit harder for the backs. Um, some wingers have come out and. Some halves over the years, which probably haven't gone as well, uh, but right at the moment, I think those um, it'll be interesting to see how those boys go at Newcastle mm. um, when they come out. They're only young. Mm. Well, Dom Young, he played one game in the Super League. Yeah, he's a bit of an anomaly, Dominic, mm. but he certainly made a, a name for himself. He just come out here uninvited, just lobbed and yeah. wanted a game. I mean, he's, uh, he can certainly play it. Now, just before we get into our look at round 16, we've got Women's Origin the night after uh, Origin 2. That's up in Townsville. And a couple of big changes for the Blues who have to win by nine points or more, Gus, to lift the shield. Yes. Uh, Tiana Panatani is back from injury, but the big one is Samima Taufa. Yes, Samima. She's my favourite. She's back from a shoulder injury. Yep. Tiana Panatani had a hamstring and missed game one. Yep. Those two players are going to be big boosts for the Blues right to win from, by that margin. Right from the start of when I started following and calling um, the women's game, Samima has been my favourite the whole time. Mm. She's a, she's a real warrior, an absolute warrior. Yeah, I just think I think if if they play with a little less structure and just let Jessie Southwell, the halfback, run her own game, I know she's only a teenager, she's only a young girl, but I think she's got the wherewithal to come up with the points to get New South Wales a good win. Um, Queensland will be hard to beat, though, particularly up there, and mm. uh, with an eight-point head start. It's, it's a two-game two, two game origin series. Aggregate points takes the shield. Yes. Anyway, you want to win the game to make it one all, and then but you know, if you can win by eight points or more, nine points or more, that'll be wonderful. Indeed. You can see it all here live and free on If nine. they win by eight points and it's a tie, do they have an extra time? I don't know. You don't well, it'd have to be extra time, wouldn't it? Well, I don't know. Well, not going to cut it enough. No, unless they start the scoreboard at 18-10, which was the full-time <laughs> score at the previous game, which would be one way to do it, I guess, wouldn't it? Because then we want to know where they stood. Yeah, but then it could still be a draw. But well, then it could be a draw, but then you could play the extra time. I need to find that out. Yeah. I don't think it will. I don't think it will be. No. It'll just be a tied series. Kissing your sister. <clears throat> Round 16. Thanks to Bluebet. All the odds correct as of 9am Wednesday, 14th of the 6th. Just to remember to ask yourself what you're really gambling with. And, of course, gamblinghelponline.org.au. Now, I've got to say, this game has got me fascinated. Friday night footy from Queensland Country Bank Stadium, Townsville. Cowboys are $2.30 outsiders against the Panthers at $1.62. There are 10 players missing from both lineups collectively with respect to origin, but they're two very formidable teams, and I think it's going to be a cracking game. Jason Talmalolo is back from a knee injury, but the Cowboys are missing Cotter, Robson, Holmes, Talangi, Nene. Uh, in comes Kulikefi, Fine Fuiaki. Uh, also, Sam McIntyre, who has just joined the club. Zach Labert, who got a, a taste of it earlier, is back. And Jake Granville, who is a premiership winning number nine, has taken... Reese Robson's place. Now, Luai, Crichton, Martin, Yo, and Toto are all out for the Panthers. They've got Jamin Salmon playing in the halves with Jack Cogger. Tyron Peachy comes into the centres. Tom Jenkins is on the wing. Matt Eisenhuth goes to lock. Luke Garner's on the bench. And Zach Hosking is back after being rested last week. Moses Leota has been named. Um, but he fell in HIA, which was deemed Category 2 last week, so they'd have to get an exemption for him. And Spencer Lenu's good to go after he uh, <laughs> got fined twice for his blue with Jared Rhea Hargreaves. So, look, both teams missing a lot of players, Gus, but I'm looking at these two teams, and they're still very strong. Shows how strong both teams are. Um, there was a game last year where Panthers rested all their players just prior to the semis, mm -hmm. virtually went with a reserve-grade side. 
and for a lot of the game really matched it with the Cowboys for a long period in that game before Cowboys got the, the better of them late in the contest and that was a <clears throat> sort of a good form reference for this game. Now, the Panthers, despite losing all those players, have still got players like Dylan Edwards, Sunia Taruba, Isaac Tungor, Tyron Peachy, um, Jamin Salmon is always a part of the 17, uh, Mitch Kenny, James Fisher-Harris, Scott Sorensen, um, you know, Sonny Luke and Spencer Lenu uh, are, are all regular parts of their, their, their side and they're all very influential players. Um, Jack Cogger did a terrific job filling in for uh, Nathan Cleary last game. Uh, obviously, he had, right. he had Jerome Luai with him, but Jamin Salmon... Um, all his junior career, I w I've been watching Jamin since he was nine years of age. He played in the same competition as my son, and um, my son played in Jamin's rep sides at, at Cronulla in Harold Matthews and SG Ball and that. And he was always a 5'8". He was a um, Australian touch footballer, Australian Oztag player. He's he's always been a very talented player. Been more used more as a utility in the back row at the Panthers since joining them. But um, I've got no doubt he's got the skill set to be a six. Looking at the Cowboys team, well, they've still got Drinkwater, they've still mm. got Kyle Felt, they've still got Peter Hicku, they've still got Semi Valmai, who's um, yeah, just going from the Rays, they've got Tommy Dearden and Chatter, they've got their halves there, they've got Jordan McLean, they've got Jake Granville, they've got Colin Hess, Luciano Lo Lua, Helam Luke Crikey, Jason. Oh, Tom, no. Oh, my God. Why are they, so mate, can you, what about Griffin this? How, can they, how are they not in the, right at the top? Well, yeah. Seriously. I think, well, I. I you know, I said it last week. They've, they've been down at the bottom of the table. They won one game, and I said they can win the comp. I never said they would. I said they can, and they can. And, but their fate could well be, you know, handled by a, a game like this. Now, Panthers are favourites. I know. And I can probably see the reason for that. My only issue with the Panthers is the points. I can, I can see them playing a great brand of, of defensive football and I can see, you know, that won't fall apart. But Drinkwater, Kyle Felt, mm -hmm. Tom Dearden, Chad Townsend, Jake Granville, Tom Malolo, Helam Luki, Luciano Leilua, there's a lot more points in those sort of blokes than there is in the work ethic and defensive prowess of the Panthers. I'm, I'm looking where the creativity comes from. Jack Cogger is steady, but he's not overly creative. Jamin Salmon hasn't played six for a long time. He is creative, but will he get the opportunity to do that? Mitch Kenny is a workman-like, you know, hooker. He's not a... Sonny Luke will have to come off the bench and do something for them. I just... I feel like the Cowboys potentially have got more points in them in a game where, mm. you know, where usually when you've got a lot of players out, it's the points that are hardest to get and defences aren't as... Um, that's a hard one. I, I don't think the difference in the market no is reflective of just how this could be. And it's at, and it's in Townsville. And, and it's in Townsville. I'm going to I'm going to go Cowboy. Cowboy have got the usual fullback, the usual six, the usual seven. Cowboy. Mm. I'll go Cowboy. Saturday, three PM in Newcastle. The Knights are dollar fifty two favourites against the Roosters at two dollars fifty five. Gee, oh, that was a cracking game. Newcastle Brisbane last week, um, and Joey Marne has gone to fullback, which means he's up against Kalen Ponga. So we had Ponga v Walsh last week. We've now got Ponga v Manu. Uh, obviously, no Tyson Frizzell, and Greg Marzi missed the bus, so they've dropped him. Uh, Luke Keary's gone to five eight. Sandon Smith is the new halfback. He's a he's a nippy little thing. Um, no Lindsay Collins, obviously. Nat Butcher has gone to prop. And a few other changes there as well. But obviously the big guns are missing for Origin with uh, the Roosters. Yeah, they are. And they're a team struggling for form. And they've you know, lost some major players there. I Look, Newcastle, can they do it again? Uh, I thought they were outstanding against the Broncos, but they still found a way to lose. Um, Oh, that's that's again a hard one. Who's favourite this week? Knights, Knights dollar Knights fifty-five on. Wow, mm. wow. Knight versus Rooster. Knight versus Rooster. I'm going to go Knight. Okay. Saturday five thirty. Dollar fifty-five. I've the two outsiders. Yeah. There. That's no, no, Knights are favourites. Oh, Knights are favourites. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Knights. Favorites. Um, power dollar fifty-five on Bluebet. 
Manly two dollars forty five. Now Dejan Arcee had a blinder in his club uh, NRL debut for Para last week in the six. He's wearing the seven this week. Ryan Madison's wearing the six. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he's back to his old junior days. Uh, King Clint scored three tries in the first half last week, so he's going to have to be a focal point of their attack, obviously. And needless to say, Manly are missing Turbo and uh, DCE. This one, uh, interesting. Combank Stadium. Yeah. 5.30 game. I think uh, Eel wins that one. Mm-hmm. Saturday, 7.30. Tigers, $2.85. Outsiders against the Storm at $1.40. Two. Uh, oh, Brooks, he's injured, isn't he? So Brandon Wakeham's playing halfback. Now, Stafford Toa is playing 5'8", Gus. Normally playing in the centres, yeah. Uh, they've got a few youngsters who are in contention to be selected. There might be some changes to that Tigers team, and obviously the guns are out for Melbourne, who yeah. are very, very firm favourites. Yeah, very good young player on the bench, Taylor De Silva, uh, mm-hmm. has been touted as a future NRL dummy half hooker. He's a very good player. Uh, just looking through these sides again. Um, yeah. Melbourne, didn't... Oh, crikey. Still got Hughes. Yeah. Nick Meaney. Still got Meaney. Warbrick, Remus Smith, Marion Seve, George Jean. Justin Olam's number 18. So he had a head, head knock last week. Bronson Garlic. Oh, gee whiz, this one's a hard... Storm of favourites, aren't they? Dollar forty two. Jerome Hughes, yeah, I'll go with the storm. Yeah. I'll go with the storm professionalism. Though. And Sunday footy, you'll see it here on nine, down in Cronulla, Points Bet Stadium, Sharks dollar twenty five, Bulldogs four dollar outsiders. The Sharkies last week. What a dead set capitulation. Yeah, well I I said last week that I would love to take up the opportunity of going down to Melbourne playing against the best teams, but the Sharks just didn't do that, did no they? No way. Um, they'll be looking to bounce back at home, and by the looks of it, the coach is stuck with the the troops. So um, no changes there. Yeah, they've 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 look they traditionally haven't had fo- they haven't had trouble with the bottom teams. They're playing a bottom team this weekend, and um, Bulldogs have managed to play a couple of teams back into form this year. So um, that'll be what the Sharks are hoping for this weekend. All right, thank you, Gus. Seven days in Origin two. Can the Blues pull off what Gus says would be their greatest ever victory at Suncorp Stadium? We'll see it. Exclusively live and free here on 9 and 9 now from 7 o'clock next Wednesday. Enjoy the week. Enjoy the weekend. Thank you. (laughs) Bye-bye. What are you really gambling with? For free and confidential support, call the number on the screen or visit the website.